sitting on the bench that day probably changed the course of my entire career. Oh, hi. Didn't see you there. Welcome back to the Wild Business Growth Podcast presented by Hippo Direct. This is your place to hear from a new entrepreneur or innovator every single Wednesday morning who's turning wild ideas into wild growth. I'm your host, Max Brandstetter, digital marketing due to Hippo Direct, and you can email me at max at hippodirect.com for help using your podcast as a marketing tool. This is episode number 78, and today's guest is Larry Edelson. He has one of the most incredible careers in the medical field you will ever hear about, and he never even went to med school. He's a serial medical entrepreneur who's invented countless medical products, exited multiple businesses, and worked on everything from family businesses, small and large, to the giant corporations of IBM, Johnson & Johnson, and more. He had a hand in the businesses that formed 1-800-CONTACTS, and he is the chairman of the award-winning Delray Medical Center. So, it's time to curb the intro and keep your enthusiasm for the incredible journey and life lessons of Larry Edelson. Enjoy the show. Alrighty, we are here with the one and only Larry Edelson. Larry, how are you doing today? I am fine. Thank you. Thank you for having me this morning. Of course. Well, it's been a great interview already. But Larry, you are the chairman of the Delray Medical Center. You've done a ton in your career that we're going to get to. Um, before we get into that, I do want to shout out and thank my lovely girlfriend, Dana, and her family, the Gottdieners, who are hosting this interview at their house. And you know, you don't live too far away. So thank you for coming as well. My pleasure. <laughs> of course. So... We're going to get into a lot of your career. There's a lot, you know, roller coaster journey, some exciting stuff there, thrills there. But before we get into really your professional career, let's let's take it back to your upbringing. If you if you could characterize for us, what was your upbringing like, and was there any sort of inclination that you knew back when you were younger, a little kid, that you would end up in this medical space and in the business world? Not necessarily. I was born in New York City, born February 7th, 1949. Oh, the birth date is coming out. There we go. There you go. (laughs) First birth date on the podcast. (laughs) Nothing wrong with that. Yes. Kind of proud of it. And lived in Brooklyn, New York. Fairly traditional upbringing. My mom, dad, sister, and I lived in one bedroom. Hmm. Never really knew anybody who lived in a house. We all lived in large buildings. (laughs) <laughs> and that's all we knew. And when you know nothing else, that's how life is. But as time went on, I realized there was something else. And I had a motivation that I didn't know was going to come out till later on. But it wasn't to live in the one bedroom again. And that's how I got the motivation and the drive at that point going up. The city of New York was probably the single most instrumental part of guiding my career. The city of New York was able to send me to a specialized high school, Stuyvesant High School in Manhattan. And they realized I probably had a brain imbalance at that time. And they were (laughs) able to work with it and dig out of that brain what was necessary to motivate somebody who would go on in life and go into science and mathematics. And I was... I was a perfect candidate for Stuyvesant High School. To this day, it's probably the most instrumental part of my education was the city of New York was able to do that. Obviously, my mom and dad were not in a position to ever send me to private mm-hmm. schools. And the city of New York had this program for those that had this little gift. And I was very fortunate. That's great. So we'll get to your education in, in, in a minute there. But back, so you were all in a one room Right. <laughs> One room place. And when my you're grandfather going... lived in the same building, grandmother and grandfather. My grandfather was an inspiration. He was uneducated, taught himself everything. And he turned out in my life to be probably one of the most educated people because there was nothing he could not do. He could learn anything he wanted on his own. He taught himself to read when he came to this country, taught himself to write. And he worked in very gainful employment 
in a funeral home in Lower Manhattan, commuted by the subway. The same subway I took to go to high school, Yeah, he took to go to work. Huh. And we were very, very close. He taught me to work with my hands, and he taught me, more importantly, to work with my brain. And it wasn't necessarily the traditional education that was the drive or the motivator, but rather the internal drive and motivator is what would come out later on in life. Well, I'm sure he's got an incredible story himself. I mean, coming over, being, you know, new to America, learning how to, teaching yourself how to read and write. That's, yeah. that's a whole thing in itself. What would you say if you had to pick one lesson that he taught you and still sticks with you to this day, what would it be? I'm keeping you to one. <laughs> that, that's, that's okay. Probably that no matter what challenge you were ever going to face, you could get through it. And if today you didn't know something, tomorrow would give you the opportunity to know it very well and to learn. And I watched him and I just studied everything about him and it got inside of me and it's there to this day. I'd rather work with my hands sometimes because it brings me back to those days that I was with him. That's incredible. And you mentioned your schooling there and how mm -hmm. impactful that was yep. in the city of New York there. So what do you take from that experience? What was so inspirational and helpful for you growing up and being in that school system, taking the subway back and forth, as you mentioned, that kind of puts you on a, on a path that you could have a lot of success? The part of that education that was so important looking back is the challenge of having it available to you and then utilizing it. And just the fact that we probably commuted an hour, hour and a half each way oh my God. from Brooklyn to the, I guess it was the 14th Street stop on D train, I remember. And I'd often <laughs> fall asleep, but somebody would always wake me just in time there or coming back. And it was coming away from that where I learned lessons in life that today I still use no matter how computerized we are and we're so integrated into the system. Mm -hmm. I learned mechanical drawing with my hands. There were no computers. And I see things today in three dimension because of the training I got. So when I see a flat piece of paper with a drawing, I'm refocused and looking at the dimensions from the top and the sides. Huh. And it's just what stayed with me. I was a wonderful student in math and science, and I was a terrible student when it came to foreign language and English. Uh, really? Yeah. I, so your I grandfather... Totally, I totally imbalanced when it came to that. My so life. your grandfather taught himself English? Yes, he but did. But he didn't help you there? No, he <laughs> did No, he did not. But it was okay. Yeah. There was time later on to master those skills. So were you always drawn to the, the math and sciences? From the, the earliest day that I remember, yes. What is it about those areas that was appealing to you? I think in both, ma especially in mathematics, was the ability to always come away with a real problem solved in a finite manner instead of something kind of just hanging out there that possibly it had three or four different mm -hmm. answers. Yeah, these Math abstracts. only had one, and it still does only <clears throat> have one, and probably in many years from today we'll still only have one. Right, <laughs> exactly. Well, and then you get into the, like, the negative numbers and infinite numbers and that yep. things with... That's for another story. Anyway, so you had one hell of an upbringing. You had really, really impactful schooling. Yeah. So what happened next uh, in terms of further education and, and starting your career? Well, then it starts to get very interesting. I graduated Stuyvesant High School. I wasn't in the top of the class. I was kind of in the middle of the class. Mm -hmm. Um, that's okay. Totally imbalanced in my college entrance exams. <laughs> I was off the chart on both sides of it. And that's what probably drew me to not be accepted to too many schools. <laughs> Went on to the university of Toledo in Toledo, Ohio. Mm, for go Rockets. For the Toledo Rockets. And I still keep up with the alumni association there and occasionally visit the school and speak to groups of people. And it's probably in Toledo, and it was the fact that it was the University of Toledo that was the single thread in my whole career 
that brought me the chance to be successful in entrepreneurship. My grandmother, who lived in the same building as us in Brooklyn, had a friend, and they sat outside on Ocean Parkway, I will never forget this, on little chairs every afternoon when it was warm enough. And they also then had a third mutual friend who sat with them. And one day, as women do, they were talking to each other. And one said to the other that she had a granddaughter that was thinking of going to the University of Toledo. And with that, my grandmother chimed in and said, my grandson goes to the University of Toledo. That sitting on the bench that day probably changed the course of my entire career. It was that fact that brought me to meet my wife today, and we're married (laughs) 50 years. And I went on my first date with my wife, who at that time lived in Jericho, Long Island. But she was drawn to me before I ever met her because my grandmother told me she lived in a house. That doesn't (laughs) sound like much, but try to understand that. If you never lived in a house, yeah. you would be totally taken by somebody who did live in a, in a real house. And she had a bedroom. Well, we never knew about having your own bedroom. <laughs> so I went to visit her in Jericho. And I wouldn't say it was a successful first date, but it was a first date. The I think mom, in the long run, it was successful. Oh, absolutely. The mom wasn't thrilled, but... It worked out okay. (laughs) And we went to Howard Johnson's on Jericho Turnpike for ice cream and had a wonderful time. And she agreed possibly to see me again. But by that time, she was admitted to the University of Toledo and she was going to go there. Mm. So we had a bond. We dated when she was at the University of Toledo. And the first three years went pretty quickly. And in our junior year, we were married during spring break. During No way. Yep. That might be the most impressive spring break story I've ever heard. Well, that's exactly how it happened. We had 10 days off and we went on a little honeymoon, <laughs> came back, went back to school. And all through college, I worked. And for some of our undergraduate education, my wife and I took the same classes But because I was working, I didn't attend as often as she did, but she had the best notes I've ever seen, and I would study from her notes and take my exams. So that's why you really liked her. That was part of it, yes. It worked out just (laughs) fine. Icing on the cake, I think. Yep. And we stayed there for a while. We both finished school together. She finished in three years to catch up with me, and I finished undergraduate school in four years. I first taught school in Toledo, Ohio, taught at Whitmer High School. I Mm. taught American history and sociology. Totally unnatural to my abilities and aptitudes, but it gave me the chance to broaden my horizon. But I knew after six months, we couldn't survive doing that because there was no economic future Mm. as a school teacher. And I needed to learn something else. Went back and started to study more coursework relating to biomedical sciences. Came back to the Northeast, where my wife and I lived. And the first opportunity I had was to work with a company in Hatboro, Pennsylvania, that manufactured medical devices for newborns and some anesthesia products and intensive and some IV therapy products. And because of my unique aptitude, they put me in product development. (laughs) And I just loved it. I was fascinated and I was able to contribute. They were working on different devices for monitoring newborns for crib death. And that's where I got my first opportunity. And I was somewhat successful. I understood electronics. I understood all the circuitry. I Mm -hmm. was... But that was the gift that I learned on my own, not from formal education. I learned more about electronics in high school and with my grandfather than I did in all the graduate work you could imagine, because the skill set was already ingrained in my head. So we, by that time, we were living in a little town on 
between New Jersey and Pennsylvania called Bordentown, New Jersey, and I commuted to Hatboro, Pennsylvania. Went from there after two years, went to the gentleman I worked for, told him I'd like to try some of this on my own. And th there were three statements he made to me when I told him I'd like to leave. The first thing was, well, Larry, you don't know anything about business. You don't have any money that I'm aware of. <laughs> and the third thing is, you're in a very competitive world. And what if you fail? Well, put all those things together. And that's what drives me to, th to this day. Yeah, there's always a possibility of failure, but I'll never fail. Because I always look back and know that I could always do what I did yesterday because I did it pretty well. Yeah. And I left. The company actually spent time and some resource helping me start my new business. Really? I had a partner, the most wonderful partner in the world. And to this day, my partner has been my wife in every business venture we've ever been in. And to this day, she's still the partner in everything we do. We... Went into a company we founded in Fords, New Jersey, called Read the Equipment Corporation of New Jersey. It stood for Research Development Corporation. Started to employ, oh, needed to buy, needed some money. That was first piece. Mm -hmm. And no one would lend me money. A bank wouldn't lend money. And that was a lesson in education that I had never come across in school. Was in business, if you need to borrow money, banks were trying to explain to me, that if you needed, we needed $10,000 back then. And this was in 19, probably mid seventies, mm -hmm. late seventies. And they explained that you needed $10,000 first before they could lend us $10,000. Well, we're in 2020 right now. And none of this makes sense to me today either. <laughs> right. If I had the 10, I wouldn't ask you for 10. Well, fortunately, there was a small bank. It was the first bank of South Jersey. They lent us $10,000. And the loan officer was an older woman, and she said, please, pay us back because I know you, you mean well, but I'll lose my job. And I said, you won't ever lose your job. You'll keep this customer forever. And forever went on for a long time. For the first three business ventures my wife and I went into, the First Bank of South Jersey was our corporate bank. Holy and cow. They had a, in one, the last one actually brought in a participating bank, which was the Gerard Bank of Philadelphia, because they couldn't handle the business. And so she this, kept her job, yep, it sounds yep. like. And she kept her job just fine, and they got their ten, first $10,000 back and became a substantial customer to them. The company grew for 10 years. It developed its own products as well as selling medical electronics in the Northeast United States. This is Reed Reed the Equipment Corporation for large medical manufacturers, as well as a unique part of the business, which by accident we stumbled upon. We started to employ biomedical engineers to maintain medical electronics within hospital environments on a contractual basis. This was in the early days of the technology that hospitals work with today. Mm -hmm. And the whole business grew. It operated 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it was a little over 10 years old. It worked mainly in intensive care nursery products, anesthesia products, electrosurgery. It was the early days of uh, laser surgery. And we were successful. 11 years later... The company was sold to an investment group. I stayed on for one year. And then I thought I would be retired. That was the dream. Well, careful what you dream about because I lasted a couple months and I knew I'd never be retired again in my life. <laughs> Why I, was that? First off, I was 34, 35 years old. Being retired and having nothing to do and nobody to play with doesn't make much sense. There was nobody around. <laughs> and then I thought I'd go back to school, take up a new career. And I didn't want to do that. I thought I'd go to law school at that time. And then I said, well, why would I want to go to law school? I could just hire a good lawyer. And Probably would save some time. Yes. And did that. There. So I had quite a lesson at that point because... As successful as I believed I was in small business, 
I'd already succeeded once. That is not the prerequisite for succeeding the next time. I wanted to go to work for a large corporation now and get large corporate experience. And in those days, and this takes you to the probably mid 1980s, mm -hmm. the Wall Street Journal on Sundays had the job ads. And I'd always get the Sunday paper and look for jobs. And no matter what I did, I sent my CV to everybody, never even got a call back. But ultimately, I saw an ad from the Pfizer Corporation looking for somebody in strategic planning on the medical electronic side. And I called. They were in Manhattan. I'll never forget this. And I said to the gentleman in human resources, I don't want the job. I want five minutes of your time, and I'd love to come talk to you. Then he said, you can come talk. And he gave me more than five minutes of his time, and he gave me a life lesson. Because my first question was probably the only question of the day was, why won't a corporation at least give me a chance to learn about me if I can contribute to their future? Mm -hmm. And he said, for such a bright guy, you're not so bright. Oh, my God. Large corporations at that level, they want line workers. They don't want entrepreneurs. You will never find a corporation bring in an entrepreneur. And I got some lesson that day. Well, I kind of readdressed what I needed to do. And within three months, IBM took a chance on me, gave me an opportunity in a joint venture of theirs. It was a two-year project, went in as the director of a project. And now I had the opportunity to get real big corporate experience, which I loved because I didn't have it. So I was able to take those two years of large corporate experience, combine it with small business entrepreneurship, and created more value to myself. I had a better understanding of business, had a better understanding of methods and systems. What's the biggest, just to contrast those two worlds you were in, what was the biggest difference you noticed about working with being an entrepreneur, being in small business versus being more of kind of the entrepreneur, part of these giant global companies? Well, the most obvious one was wearing a dark blue suit every day. <laughs> But the reality was the structure was something that entrepreneurs on a small scale don't have and don't have the ability to maintain. And in some cases, don't have the resource to maintain that type of structure. Right, yeah. IBM gave me the tools and the understanding for the necessity to be able to do that. And I was able to carry that forward in the rest of my career. This project lasted two years, and I had a chance to stay with IBM as an employee forever, but I now had the tool that I needed, and it was time to move on. The next day, became the chief operating officer of a company in Cranford, New Jersey, called Physician Computer Network, and it was the idea of a brilliant man named Jerry Brager, not my idea, and he had figured out a method to link high volume prescribing physicians to the pharmaceutical industry prior through computers prior to the internet. <laughs> and in mid 1980s, took it public, raised a bunch of money, but I was there for two years, but I was getting bored again and it was time to move <laughs> on because now I'd done something different, gave me more exposure. And this is what probably directed the course of my business career going forward was at that moment, had one more trip to make for this company, flew from Newark, New Jersey to Chicago, Illinois on a continental flight. And as the plane was getting ready to land in Chicago, I had the airline magazine in my lap out of boredom. And for some reason looked at a page and it had an article about a company called Johnson & Johnson that they had developed a disposable contact lens. And I felt like I got hit with a brick on the side of my head because I now had my next business the minute that plane touched down in Chicago. Called my wife, told her, I'll be back in two days and we got a brand new business. That's an effective airplane magazine. It certainly you know. was.
Very impactful. Yep. And I spent the next two days finishing up what I needed to for this company called Physician Computer Network, but at the same time was putting the business plan together for the contact lens business. I flew home, but what I did know is I needed a business partner who was an ophthalmologist to work with me to make this a reality and had a gentleman in the same town I lived with that I lived in. His name was Anthony McCalley, a practicing ophthalmologist. And we founded in 1987, the ultimate contact. And we were one of the, it was one of the first mail order contact lens companies in the United States. It was the most difficult business venture I have ever been involved in in my entire life because I, for the first time, was becoming a disruptor of the chain of product sales, especially in one that had been so closely controlled because it gave the consumer for the first time a chance to purchase a contact lens at a competitive price and in a competitive market. Well, it had always been a controlled product. It had been a prescription product, and it was on behalf of the Optometric Network. It was planning to stay that way. Well, we took everybody on, and within the first two years, the state of New Jersey enacted, tried to enact legislation to prohibit mail-order sales of contact lenses. Oh, my God. And I now got the reality of learning about state government and how the legislature works, of which I knew nothing about. We spent days in Trenton, New Jersey, fighting this bill. We learned all about lobbyists and had one of the probably luckiest days in business was in the state Senate in New Jersey when the bill was introduced to prohibit mail order sales. I will never forget that my partner was with me and had introduced him as the executive vice president of the company. His name was Anthony McCallie. I did not introduce him as being a practicing ophthalmologist at the time. Well, when the bill was introduced and they asked who was opposed to the bill, well, obviously we stood up and somebody from the optometric group said to both of us, well, Neither of you know anything about the medical issues related to contact lenses. And you can get all these rare diseases and create vision issues. And with that, Tony McCallie, I'll never forget, said to everybody in the Senate chamber, excuse me, I've been a practicing ophthalmologist in the state of New Jersey for 25 years, and I've never seen any of the things that you're talking about, son. (laughs) And... It was a little while later, the bill was defeated. It never went any further, never left the state Senate. And we were able to keep the business in New Jersey. It grew to be a rather large business. It was sold in the year 2000 to a venture capital firm. And with that company, I relocated to South Florida and acquired a company here that I invested in also personally called Lens Express and ran that for a year. And ultimately, the whole business was sold into the 1-800-CONTACTS platform where it still resides today. So that's where 1-800-CONTACTS comes from. Well, no, 1-800-CONTACTS started after I did, but they went a far different route than I did. They were far more aggressive. They took it public. They weren't as fearful of violating state and federal Mm -hmm. laws at the time. They had a lot of ophthalmologists on hand. They had a lot of resource and they were the brightest two gentlemen I've probably been around in my business career. One named Jonathan (laughs) Kuhn and one named John Nichols were the two founders of 1-800-CONTACTS. And I was just proud to know them and watch them and yeah. enjoyed it. Well, it's so I, cool you were a part of that. That was. Yeah. I stayed on as a consultant to them for many years and just until recently have had quite a lot of contacts with them, with the company. Contacts the company the was acquired recently, well, several years back by another firm called Thomas H. Lee 
and it was purchased for one billion dollars. Billion with the B. With a B. Oh my! And that was a lesson. Perhaps we left the contact lens industry too soon, but it's okay. <laughs> You made, was, you made your mark on it. Oh, <laughs> did I ever? And I enjoyed it. I, I loved it. Never looked back. So your career, when you look back on it, when you were talking about your upbringing earlier, there's nothing that really says you're going to go the medical route or you're going to go the business route. So what what is it that made you end up on the medical side of things throughout so much of your career and having so much success there? It always appears to me looking back that... You never know ahead of time what's going to grab your attention and what's going to motivate you to want to dig deeper. It was always the fascination of the medical type products that gave me the Mm, the drive. Like the technology? The technology. I loved it. And to this day, I do. Once the contact lens business was gone and I was living in South Florida, Still never liked getting up in the morning and playing golf with a bunch of old guys. Not that I didn't like the old guys. I just (laughs) was totally bored. And I knew I couldn't be retired again. And I needed to find something else to do. I decided to take some healthcare consulting assignments. Took them all over the United States. And fortunately, through a contact, wound up with a consulting job in Pompano Beach, Florida. I took a consulting job with a diabetes online company. They'd been, I'd say, five or 10 years old at the time and had some issues that needed to be dealt with. And I went in as a consultant, dealt with those, and within three months had been approached by the two principals and asked if I'd be interested to stay on as their president CEO for the next couple of years. I stayed for two years, built the company, loved it, And it's time to move on one more time. But by this time, I had a slightly different twist and focus in my career path. I have three sons. By that time, they were grown all into their careers or getting ready to go into their careers. And the youngest son had gone on to become a veterinarian. He always talked to me about the need of product for veterinary diabetes. And again, we built a business plan, built an online company and an online presence for products that relate to veterinary diabetes. And to this day, we still operate that company. Oh my God. We we have our youngest son, who's a practicing veterinarian, is involved in it. My oldest son, who is the CPA, is the gentleman who takes care of how this business operates. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of the old man who just enjoys every day with it. I think you mean young man. But well, besides, whatever. It's besides okay. that seemed accurate. <laughs> it seems as though, well, you've brought up boredom a lot. So boredom is clearly a big driver for you of switching up. Yep. I'm just blown away that you've experienced every kind of business there is out there. Like you've done small businesses, you've been an entrepreneur, big major global corporations, and now you have the family aspect, and well, as, and with your wife mm-hmm. as well, you've done family business for a while. Is there something that draws you to experience a new kind of business each time as opposed to, you know, say, jump from one corporation to another? There's no clear-cut delineator as to what causes you to go from one to another. What is interesting is that Certain parts of a business capture my attention. And I think probably deep inside, there's a part of me that's a bit of a rebel. So when I see something that's a disruptor, that can be done better and more efficiently for the consumer, as well as the business motivation of doing it, I look more deeply into it. And I find that that works well for us. But along the way, the part of the career that I haven't addressed much is probably in the early 80s, I got involved with a hospital sitting on their board in New Jersey, Bayshore Community Hospital, and ultimately went on to become a vice chairman of their holding company. And with that, got involved in hospital board governance, stayed with that, 
But by the time I relocated to South Florida, I had given all that up. But unfortunately, your past never leaves you. Uh, I was here a couple of years and somebody remembered me from New Jersey and reconnected with me. And the next thing I knew, I was sitting on the board of Delray Medical Center and three years later was asked to become the chairman of their board. And just like that. Just like that. So that's what I mean. do today, by the way. <laughs> and so if I'm just, you know, going out around this neighborhood, introduce myself to neighbors, you'd think I'll get a spot on the hospital board as well. Is that how this works? No, it's more that in just the past, that it's, it's in the past. That's what I had been involved in. And hospital board governance is kind of a specialized area. Um, lots of moving parts to it. Very frustrating because of healthcare in the United States. Right. And it's one that I've devoted a lot of my time to. Uh, Delray Medical Center is owned by Tenant, which is a public company. Mm -hmm. And it is a for-profit hospital. And it's been a very, very successful hospital in the United States. It's 525 beds. And it's a level one trauma center. And it operates very, very well. As you mentioned, award-winning hospital, award-winning medical center, very well regarded. What would you say is the biggest thing that drives you and the team towards success? What allows you, because the medical space, especially hospitals, medical centers, it's such a challenging world and there's so much involved there. I believe to this moment that it's the culture that's been created over the last several years of the administration and the caregivers every day, 24 hours a day. And that goes from the emergency room on up to the people who are involved in the discharge of the patient. It's a culture and it's a fairly cohesive family in there. And I still enjoy it and look forward to continuing to do it for quite some time. Family is everything. Yes, it yeah. is. Yeah. So you finally decide to start a podcast. Congrats. You've never been more excited. But wait a sec. You quickly find out this is way more of a time commitment than you initially thought. You're going to need someone that has you covered behind the scenes. That's where I come in. Email me at max at hippodirect.com and let's get wild. Let's switch gears a little bit. Let's get to a fan favorite segment called the Wild Business Shoutout of the Week. The Wild Business Shoutout of the Week! <laughs> I know, this is very, very impressive. Anyway, Wild Business Shoutout of the Week. So this is where we talk about a recent ad or campaign that gets you going, gets you excited about. And on the note about the Delray Medical Center, there's something that you guys are doing, a kind of newer campaign that you're rolling out. Take me to Delray. So what is it about this that you're, that you're so excited about? I think what I'm so excited about is that when I first saw the tagline, I chuckled to myself and I said, how is this going to work? It's kind of <laughs> corny. Well, the reality is we don't know what we don't know. And as the months have gone by and I started to watch the success that this tagline generated as it was attached to so much of our marketing material and how successful it was becoming, I learned. And it was such a broad reach of people. We have a unique demographic of patient because being located in this part of South Florida. And we grab onto lots of people who have realized that unfortunately when you're going to a hospital, you don't want to go, but you, you don't have a choice. And when you have multiple institutions to go to, there's something that stays in their head about the meaning of take me to Del Rey. It's not by accident that that tagline's out there today. There's yeah. Good it, reason for it. It's got a good ring to it. Yeah. Yes. So you saw it out kind of in the public, in the wild. Was yeah. that kind of your first time? Same yeah, well, or... we had discussed it. I had heard about it in probably once every quarter. We review some of the marketing at the board meetings about what the mm -hmm. hospital is doing. And I saw the line on some of our ads and questioned as to what are we doing this for? <laughs> and boy, did I get some great lesson. I loved every second of it. <laughs> what would you say is the biggest challenge when it comes to marketing a hospital? I think it's a lack of understanding of how hospitals operate on behalf of the consumer and how the media has portrayed hospitals. You know, hospitals are basically very sophisticated factories that are kept open 24 hours a day with 
no downtime whatsoever. And building and marketing a hospital is very difficult on the consumer level because there are so many pieces to it. As, as a patient, when you're in the hospital, you to see what goes on and how it operates. And healthcare is probably the number one issue in this country right now that we face. And how it operates because of the financial structure is always going to be a challenge and one that's going to continue to go on. Mm-hmm. So we hope we do the best every day. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you guys are working wonders and it's, it's just so intricate. Like there's so many challenges. It's fine. I mean, I'm so used to talking about things from, you know, the business and marketing perspective, but when you put, you know, people's lives at stake as part of it, like talk about adding, <laughs> adding some to the mix there. Oh my God. Yeah. So only a little bit of time left here. Love to wrap up with some rapid fire Q and a fire away. You ready for it? All right. Fire away. I like it. Let's get wild. What is your biggest pet peeve? I think the, the biggest pet peeve that I struggle with is sometimes people not being direct enough when they speak to me instead of just not telling me what they really want to say and kind of just go around in a circle trying to get where they want to go. And all you have to do is just come out and say it. Mm, and we'll, you're talking about this interview, aren't you? No, not I'm at kidding. all. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, well, you're positioned that way, but the mic is this way. No. no. Yeah, that's that's key. I get Yeah, there's no need to dance around that. Nope. You mentioned how... You worked in product development for a lot and mm -hmm. you've, you're obviously very good at coming up with new ideas and implementing new ideas there. When you think about creativity and implementing creativity, when you, when you do those kinds of things, what would you say is the biggest thing that's helped you be more creative? I mean, it could be a hobby that you do that you come with, up with ideas, or it could be a mindset. I think because my whole life, when I had the opportunity, I developed fairly interesting hobbies I've been a performing magician for probably 20 years. No way. Yeah. And I've we been could have a, done a whole magician interview. See, look at that. <laughs> and I've been a general aviation pilot for most of my life. And it gave oh me God. the chance to look at and learn creativity and a, a presence in front of other people on the magic side. And in the general aviation side, it taught me the necessity of being exact and precise all the time. Well, you're officially my favorite magician, pilot, chairman of Delray Medical Center of all time. So thank you very much. Well, we'll give you the award. We'll print it off right after here. That's, oh my God. I, okay. I'm, <laughs> I have way too many questions now, but we'll, we'll, we'll go to uh, something completely random. If you could only eat one food for the rest of your life, if it had to be the same food over and over again, but it could be anything you want. What would that be? Pistachio ice cream. That is a very specific and wonderful answer. <laughs> it's good stuff. That is the answer, I, by the way. I thought you were going to say pistachio, straight up pistachios, which I do love, but that's a lot of effort for the rest of your life. And, uh, you know, you're in this community, Addison Reserve, wonderful community. What's your favorite part of living here? Probably over time, I've been here 19 years, 14 years as a full-time resident. And I just think, getting to know people and meeting some very fascinating people and meeting very, very nice people, people that I'm very comfortable with and people that I want to be with. I can definitely vouch for that. Got knowing the God Diener. And last question, what was your go-to magic trick? Probably the rising eyeglasses off the table was always my go-to illusion. And I did it in business meetings and did it either for adults and for children. It was always probably the most, it was just a levitation trick. Oh. It was an illusion and it was always there for me. Cora, you just put the, push the levitation button and it all works. Yes, all right. Did. Well, we might have to demonstrate that after. Fair enough. <laughs> but thank you so much, Larry. This has been wonderful. Really appreciate you sharing your story and all the amazing things you've done in your career and your life and all the amazing people you've met. And, you know, I feel like we could just go on and on and on, but only have so much time today. Where is the best place for people to connect with you? People can email me if they'd like. Uh, my email address is lettelson at comcast.net. Perfect. And that works. More, more than glad to respond to anybody. That works great. Yeah, I can vouch for that. You've definitely done so. And 
last thing here, stage is yours. Final thoughts. It could be a quote. It could be a, your favorite life lesson. Whatever you want, send us off here. I think that it's, it's the life lesson and it's built into how we operate where we somehow in time develop a fear, a fear of failure. And I think the driver in my life has been the fear of failure early on until I learned that that is the greatest motivator of all. And that's what always pushed me to the next venture and to the days when things weren't great. When I knew that, you know what, I wasn't going to fail and I was going to be successful. Just keep that vision, look straight ahead, and just don't deviate. We've done that. Not your standard deviation by any means. Thank you, Larry, for coming on the podcast and sharing your story in unbelievable life lessons. And thank you, Wild listeners, for tuning in to another episode. If you want to hear more wild stories like this one, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite app and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can also explore our marketing and business growth resources at hippodirect.com slash blog and hippodirect.com slash newsletter. That newsletter is the Hippo Digest, and it's your place for wild marketing ideas every single week. And, of course, come say hello on your favorite social media platforms at the handles Hippo Direct and Max Brandstetter. Until next time, let your business run wild. Bring on the bongos!